Welcome back to the Machine Learning 101 course. Today we will cover the most important model, neural networks. A quick recap so far. We have now covered a wide array of models that can be used for supervised learning problems. We learned about Naive Bayes and SVMs in the last lesson. We discussed the Movie Review Sentiment Prediction task as a text classification problem. We learned the different steps for preparing data for model training. The most important step is the vectorization step. This is when we convert variable length sequence of tokens to fixed length numerical feature vectors that can be used to train a model. Now, let's learn about neural networks. Deep learning and neural networks are by far the most important machine learning algorithms in today's world. They power everything from environment perception for self-driving cars to voice assistance and speech translation. In this video, we're going to learn how these models work. The problem of supervised learning can also be expressed as the problem of function approximation, or curve fitting. Many times, the functions that interest us are way more complicated. For example, a function that takes in English sentences and outputs French translations. We need to use a model that has a lot of expressiveness, or the ability to express a wide range of functions, especially complex ones. An increasingly popular set of models that can fit complex functions are neural networks. Neural networks are composed of individual neurons inspired by biological neurons. A neuron receives multiple inputs, which are combined as a weighted average. This weighted average is then fed into an activation function. This function outputs a single value, which is zero for low inputs and one for high inputs. It can be approximated by the S-shaped logistic function. So essentially, a neural network is a sequential arrangement of logistic regression functions, or neurons, whose outputs are then fed as inputs to other neurons. We'll see how this arrangement of simple functions is capable of representing complex functions. Let's take the simple example of modeling logic gates. Logic gates are defined by these tables, called truth tables, and checks whether both inputs are one, or checks if at least one input is one, and XOR checks if exactly one input is one. Let's try to represent these functions using a linear boundary that separates the zeros and the ones. It's quite easy to do this for AND and OR, as you can see here. However, things get complicated when trying to model XOR with a linear or logistic function, which cannot fit this nonlinear boundary. However, we can represent XOR as a composite function or one which takes the outputs of other functions as its inputs. One way to do this is to define a function h1, which is the OR function, and h2, which is not AND. Remember, the XOR operation requires that only one input be one, but not both. So let's bring back the OR function that we saw before and now call it h1. For h2, let's bring back the AND function but this time we'll flip the ones and the zeros to create the not and function. Finally, we can combine the outputs from h1 and h2 using the and function. The points 1, 1 and 0, 0 from the raw feature space are now mapped to the transform feature space here. XOR for these points evaluates to 0 since either both points are 1 or neither is 1. Similarly, the points 1, 0 and 0, 1 from the raw feature space are mapped to the transform feature space here, overlapping each other. XOR for these points evaluates to 1, because here only one value is equal to 1. As we can see, the XOR operator is perfectly modeled by the combined output of H1 and H2, which can now be fit easily by a linear boundary in the transformed feature space. In this neural network, H1 and H2 are the neurons in the hidden layer, which lies between the input and output layers. We've successfully solved the problem by stacking two layers of neurons. It turns out that by stacking more and more layers of neurons, that is, by creating deep neural networks, we are able to model very complex functions. That's why it's called deep learning. In our case, the logistic regression units use sigmoid activation functions. However, there are many other options. Right now, variants of ReLU are in fashion. 
To recap, neural networks are inspired by how the human nervous system operates. Neural networks consist of hidden layers of neurons, such that each neuron is like a tiny model in and of itself, very similar to the logistic regression models we learned about earlier. Each neuron computes the weighted sum and applies the nonlinear activation function to generate an output that is fed into the next layer. Remember, the video focused on sigmoid as the activation function, but others like ReLU and TANH are also commonly used. The output of the final layer is used as the model prediction. This flow of information from the input layer to the hidden layers and finally reaching the output layer is called forward propagation. Simple neural networks have a single hidden layer and a small number of hidden neurons. As the number of hidden layers increase and the number of neurons per layer grows, we step into the realm of deep neural networks. In case of regression problems, the output node simply computes the weighted sum of the inputs and that is used as the model prediction, just like linear regression. In case of binary classification, the output node acts like a logistic regression model and applies sigmoid activation function to the weighted sum in order to predict class probability. The more interesting case is multi-class classification. In this case, the output layer has multiple neurons, one per class. For example, in here, we have five classes, hence five the neurons in the output layer. After each neuron computes the weighted sum, the softmax activation function is applied. Softmax activation converts independently computed weighted sums into relative probabilities such that the sum of probabilities is 1. The final prediction is the class with the highest relative probability, for example the second class with a probability of 0.9 in the example over here. Now, let's understand how a neural network actually learns. The same concepts of a cost function and the gradient descent algorithm also apply for neural networks. First, we initialize the model parameters randomly and use forward propagation to compute the output. Based on the output, we calculate the cost function. Then, we use gradient descent to compute the adjustments we need to make in order to reduce the output error. Now the key difference here is that in case of neural networks, this output was produced by a sequence of computations. Hence, even the error needs to be backpropagated across all these layers, all the way back to the first set of weights that acts on the input layer. We repeat these steps of forward propagation and backward propagation to adjust the weights across all layers until we are satisfied with the cost. A neural network where a neuron is connected to all other neurons in the next layer is called a fully connected neural network. This is what we refer to when we use the term artificial neural network, or ANN. Here is an example of a very simple ANN that only has two input features, a single hidden layer with three neurons, and a single output node. Together, this ANN has 11 parameters, that is, weights and biases, to learn. The number of parameters grows exponentially as the number of neurons and the number of hidden layers increases. Once this number is huge, let's say more than a million, we enter the realm of deep learning. The power of these models lie in the flexibility they provide. We can create many different architectures as we will see in the subsequent lessons. The problem for this week's hands-on exercise is the same. Identify whether a movie review is positive or negative. We will use neural networks to tackle this problem and compare their performance to SVM and Random Forest, the model we used last time. To try using neural networks for another problem, check out this lesson's problem.md file. It looks at the same spam filtration problem, but this time with neural networks. You can also watch these videos to learn more about backward propagation and the use of neural networks for text-related problems. Now, we are done covering all the important supervised learning algorithms. We have also seen how to apply machine learning for unstructured text data. In the next lesson, we will look at another type of unstructured data, images. We will understand the limitations of ANNs for computer vision problems and learn about CNNs, the most commonly used deep learning algorithm for tasks involving images.